Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Mazda Pavilion Theatre. We're thrilled to welcome the Energy Institute to our stage, who are going to be discussing their work and their presence at COP28. Okay, I think we're on, yes. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm just going to make a brief introduction of, of the panelists and then just leave it to them. First is um, Juliet Davenport, who is the president of the Energy Institute uh, and renewable energy pioneer. Dr. Nick Waith, who is the chief executive of the Energy Institute. Dr. Waddah Ghanim Al Hashmi, who is honorary chair of the Energy Institute in the Middle East. And not last but not least is Shata Altai, who is uh, the chair of the Young Professionals Middle East and associate director of ESG advisory at KMPG. And I'm Kate Dorian, I am a fellow of the Energy Institute. And today the reason we're doing this is a, to um, give you the results of the, or the highlights of the barometer which is focused on the UAE this year exceptionally because of COP28 and also to uh, discuss the, um, the Energy Institute's work in including the, uh, uh, the uh, energy, <laughs> the, uh, the recent statistical review of, of energy which used to be a BP, um, used to be known as the BP statistical review. So without further ado, I will uh, give the floor to Juliet to start us off, or Nick, sorry. So uh, a very good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for coming along. Um, I'm conscious there's a lot of uh, noise around, so I'll try and project. Uh, my name's Nick Waith. I'm the chief exec of the Energy Institute. A huge thank you to the Mazda team and Katie uh, for allowing us to present on their stage today. And thank you all for coming. So I'm just going to very briefly introduce who the Energy Institute is and what we do. Um, we are a, a global uh, chartered membership body for people working in energy based in London, but we have a very strong position uh, in the Middle East under the excellent leadership of Dr. Wada and uh, Shahada um, with our young professionals. And uh, over 100 years of a history, and, and really the three things we do as an organization are number one, we're seeking to attract and develop uh, the energy workforce. We do that through chartering uh, people, uh, energy managers, uh, engineers, environmentalists, uh, through a, a, a broad range of training programs. We are shortly gonna be launching our Energy Institute Academy. And today I'm delighted to announce we've actually launched our executive leadership in energy program along with Holt Ashridge, and hopefully you can get a leaflet um, uh, out there in the, in the audience. So um, we do a huge amount of development and a huge amount of trying to attract um, people from a far greater diversity set than the energy industry has historically. Uh, the next area I'll talk about is our technical work. We, we work with uh, around 60 technical partners, with regulators, with academics to make energy uh, lower carbon, safer, and more efficient. We do that through a large technical program, convening all of those players, uh, working in everything from aviation, fuel through to car um, uh, carbon uh, capture, hydrogen, CCUS, renewables, power, storage, the whole range of technologies in energy. And then lastly, we try and inform good energy decision making through convening experts like yourselves, uh, we do that through products like the Energy Barometer, through our big flagship event, uh, International Energy Week, um, that we hold in London each February, and through the Statistical Review of World Energy, um, which we uh, took over this year, and I'll say a few words on in a moment. So that, in about two minutes, is what we are and what we do. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand over to uh, Dr. Hwada to talk about the Energy Barometer. Assalamualaikum, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Uh, I, I don't know if you can hear me. I hope you can. I'm trying to speak a bit louder. Um, so, uh, yeah, welcome, welcome to this uh, launch event. Uh, I, I, I want to uh, give 
uh, also a warm, warm welcome, obviously, to our uh, visitors, our chair, um, Ms. Uh, Juliet and, uh, and Dr. Nick Waite from, uh, from the Energy Institute. Um, uh, welcome to the UAE. And, um, and I, I just want to talk, take a few minutes to talk about uh, the uh, UAE Energy Barometer. So the UAE Energy Barometer is a report or a, uh, that has been published in the UK, um, really trying to get the insights from uh, energy professionals within the 21,000 maybe membership strong organization, which is, as Nick said, more than 100 years old. So the barometer actually tries to assess, try to get really insights from uh, uh, different practitioners and different people who are working in the field. And you know, energy, you know, people who are members of the Energy Institute come from all walks of life, all backgrounds. Um, um, uh, you could, as any kind of engineer, if you are a mechanical, and uh, chemical, <coughs> um, electrical, environmental engineer, could get chartered through the Energy Institute. So we have, as an institute, um, a very good, um, uh, a very good opportunity to have really a good mix of people um, who, who come and become chartered or become also members of the Institute. So what we do is basically the energy barometer uh, is usually um, a sort of a survey which goes out to the members. Um, in the UK, uh, it goes out to the 20, 21,000 members. The response rate um, you know, usually is less than 20%, usually around about 12 to 15%. Now, you might think that that's quite low, actually, for surveys in academic kind of research or semi-academic research, that's a really good response rate, actually. Um, we could foresee, when we started this project, to do this in the UAE, and I want to thank the Energy Institute for uh, this year, uh, given that it was COP28 here in the UAE, uh, uh, by basically um, funding the research and, and actually being committed, and it's part of their commitment really here to the Middle East, <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> to do the energy barometer here in the in the UAE, um, we realize that we don't have as many members. We don't have thousands of members here in the Middle East, and uh, therefore uh, we would get, uh, uh, you know, even if we got very good survey response rates of say 20, 30 percent, we would still have an issue with the data. So we designed this in such a way with the research team in London to uh, cover the survey. Uh, so we did the survey before we did the survey at the launch event. We we brought in about 40, 50 people. Uh, Harriet Watt University in the Knowledge Village here in Dubai was very kind enough to, to uh, sponsor and support us to do that launch event. Uh, it was a very, very good event. We were able to use the Mentimeter to get also feedback from people. We used that data. Then we launched the survey for approximately two, two to three months. Um, we got a, a relatively good response rate, uh, I think about 20%. Um, and uh, then after that, we did um, in-depth interviews with around about 15, 16 practitioners. Uh, as well uh, as part of the mixed methods. And then after that, we did with the, with the UAE or, or the Middle East board, uh, we did a validation of the data. So I'm quite confident of the data that will be, will be sort of presented in the report. Um, there's, some, there's some key insights uh, that we'll, we'll talk about. Shall I talk about them now or we'll talk about them later? Now, yeah? Uh, Shada, you want to talk about the insights? Um, so I think in terms of the, the insights from uh, the survey, um, we ended up having more than 100 respondents, whether through um, taking the survey or through the engagement sessions that Dr. Wadah and uh, Dr. Nick just mentioned, um, as well as the um, panel discussions that we've ran throughout the year. Uh, to really get the insights and to really get the story behind the numbers that we would see from the survey itself. Um, so what you'll see here is some of the uh, high-level insights, but of course, um, if you head over to um, our, um, our website page, you'll be able to get the full report with all the insights, et cetera, explained out for you. Um, but just a few of the things that we thought were of interest is the fact that a lot of the survey respondents really feared that climate change um, would be a bigger risk in this part of the world, uh, in the UAE, especially on the way of life, 
um, that we have here um, than elsewhere. And you know, this is something that I think we've all experienced throughout this COP. Um, I think one of the biggest comments that we've received is that um, it's December, it's the first week of December already, and it's um, 30 degrees outside, and, and everyone's really feeling that increase in, in temperature um, that our survey respondents also fear is, is a, a big climate change risk um, that we have here uh, in UAE. Um, and that doesn't only impact uh, our way of life and maybe um, the working conditions around um, some of the energy sector professionals' um, uh, plants and sites, etc. Um, but it would also lead to an increase in energy demand. Um, it also um, you know, impacts um, efficiencies because with higher temperatures, plants and operations are not as efficient, etc. So there are a lot of implications and risks um, that hit um, the, the region as well. Um, another key area is around uh, water. Uh, so similar to um, what you might have also heard uh, from other surveys, that the UAE has um, a higher uh, per capita consumption of water than the average world um, uh, consumption. Um, and also in this part of the world, water is uh, mainly coming from desalination, uh, which is again, is very energy intensive. Um, so a lot of these insights are aligned with um, the expectations um, that we have um, from uh, different engagements and different panel discussions around similar topics that we've had in the past as well. Um, now moving on to maybe more of the challenges that we have, um, especially when it comes to uh, the economy itself and the energy security for the UAE. Um, we see that um, a lot of the areas are related to the fact that the economy is still um, linked to oil and gas exports. Um, and again, looking at uh, market prices, looking at um, all of those different topics, a lot of the survey respondents, I think around 60% uh, of them or so, um, thought that um, there should be more of uh, a move towards uh, cleaner fuels um, to really be part of the export mix. Um, so not just the uh, domestic energy mix, but also part of what the uh, UAE and the country is exporting um, uh, outside the country. Um, and then I think, you know, more advocacy that we've seen from the survey as well, around 28% um, or so of respondents thought um, that it's actually uh, critical for the UAE to uh, completely replace oil and gas exports and to really uh, focus a lot more on uh, cleaner alternatives as part of the um, export strategy as well. So I think a lot of those are, you know, key insights um, that we've had in terms of the challenges. Um, what we also see in terms of um, the econo economy's reliance on, on um, uh, the energy as well, so energy demand is quite high, just like what we talked about with the, with the water um, uh, just shortly. Um, so that's also the energy intensity being quite high in this part of the world is, is another uh, challenge for this transition uh, that the survey respondents saw. Um, and also um, maybe when it uh, look when we're looking at um, some of the skills and the low carbon or green skill sets that are available um, so th those were also other insights that we had that this is another challenge uh, to be addressed in the region um, I think moving on maybe um, to the, some of the actions or some of the opportunities and then I'll then hand over to you, Dr. Waddah to share a bit more about your insights. Um, but some of the opportunities um, that uh, came out as part of the um, survey were around energy efficiency. And the fact that um, it was actually singled out by the, by the survey respondents as a key area that's, that hasn't been tapped in uh, fully, um, especially because um, it could have uh, positive um, costs or no regrets costs, so you could be saving actually from energy efficiency applications, et cetera. Um, and then also looking at uh, demand side management was again a very key area that uh, came up um, in, the, in the survey as well. Um, so looking at um, some of the um, designing for uh, net zero buildings, for example, or looking at more stringent um, uh, standards for buildings, uh, looking at incorporating the aspects and principles of sustainability and circular economy as part of the built environment um, in the region is also another uh, key area. 
Um, and then, of course, um, the survey respondents thought that, there were, that the UAE was also on plan when it comes to the investments that they've made, when it comes to uh, new technologies, um, energy storage, uh, solar, etc. cetera. Um, but then maybe some of the insights were around the need for more uh, or clearer uh, policies and mechanisms um, that how, you know, how the net zero ambition will be achieved. And, and you know, that's something that will be uh, perhaps uh, laid out a bit more um, uh, in, a, in a bit more of a concrete way as we progress towards uh, the net zero um, journey. Um, some of the priorities were also around um, incentives. So um, that goes in both ways. So looking at uh, tax breaks, um, having some carbon uh, taxes, but also looking at uh, tax breaks for uh, clean technologies and clean fuels, et cetera. Um, and also looking at um, some other areas like investments in new technologies and R&D, uh, which we're already seeing a lot of progress on. Um, another, I think, key um, insight from, from the survey was around um, uh, methane emissions and around um, sort of cutting back on those and the need for uh, a bit more uh, scrutiny and monitoring, um, which I think is already something that we're seeing uh, with the UAE um, being part of the uh, Global Methane Pledge um, a couple of uh, COPs ago. Um, and also um, perhaps with uh, maybe some words that we've already heard from uh, COP president, uh, COP28 president, uh, Dr. Sultana Jabir around um, really um, the oil and gas sector having some um, more active participation towards cutting back on uh, methane emissions and flaring and so on. So I think those are just a bit of the insights that we have. And I think we also have some other thoughts from uh, Dr. Wadda uh, or Nick around this. So I think, thank you, Shahad, a fantastic job. So um, we're just going to move on in the interest of time to the Statistical Review of World Energy. Um, this is normally a 40-minute presentation. I'm going to try and do it in two minutes. Um, Abdul Latif has copies, if you haven't picked up a copy. Just very briefly by way of context, this product is 72 years old. For the first 71 year, years of its life, BP led it, and this year, uh, with our partners KPMG and Carney, we were delighted to take this on. It's the definitive guide as to how the world consumed, produced, and traded coal, oil, gas, renewables, hydro, nuclear in the prior year. Uh, and I guess there's um, five key insights from the data from 2022. Uh, Number one, uh, the world continued to have the bounce back from COVID that we saw a massive bounce back in 2021. In 2022, that, that bounce back was a little less uh, high, but still very significant, although with regional differences, uh, with China lagging the rest of the world due to the zero COVID uh, policy that we saw in China really through to the end of 2022. Uh, the second big uh, finding was, of course, the conflict in Ukraine created unprecedented changes in the trade flows of natural gas in particular, but also crude oil, refined products, uh, and indeed coal, as, as basically gas outpriced uh, Asia from um, natural gas and coal backfilled. The third big story of the year was record growth in renewables. We saw 84% uh, of net additions in power coming from renewables, although it's important to say that renewables is only or not even keeping up with the overall growth that we're seeing in energy. So although record growth in renewables, 100 terawatt hours in solar added just in China in one year, it's still not going fast enough to displace the increase in demand. So when you put all that together, the fourth big finding was that the uh, contribution of coal, oil, and gas still remains at 82%, uh, um, and that number has barely changed in the last decade, even the last two decades. And then lastly, um, the uh, emissions from, uh, from energy continue to grow um, slightly slower than the growth of energy. So energy grew at 1%, emissions grew at 0.8%. So clearly emissions continuing to move in the wrong direction. That was the two minute summary. All the data, all the numbers are available online and in the report. Um, but in the interest of time, I'll hand back to Kate, who will open it up for a, a broader discussion. Yes, um, thank you very much.
Um, is there any, are there any questions about the barometer and the results? I mean, one of the, I think one of the, the most interesting findings, despite all the challenges, is that more than 60% of respondents actually think, believe that the UAE will achieve its emissions targets by 2050. And as we know, they have actually brought forward the, uh, the pledge to cut methane emissions by 2045. That's ad hoc. So th does anybody have anything that they would like to ask? any of our panelists about the barometer, about the institute's work? Uh, yes, please go ahead. Hello. How, like, what percentage of respondents, like, were working in oil and gas? Just, like, how big is that number in the UAE? I know it's obviously going to be, I don't know, the majority of it, but... You mean, you mean the number, the, the percentage of respondents in the oil and gas business yeah. in the barometer? Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure you mean in terms of the people who are responded who work for oil and gas. Um, I don't know. We can, we can find that out. I think that was, that was maybe uh, one, of the, one of the questions that was asked. Uh, uh, I'm not sure, uh, but I can get that, get, uh, get that data for you if you're... If you're uh, interested we'll give you the contact details and we can get that data for you but I would I would say <coughs> I'd imagine quite a sizable number because in the Middle East most of the people who work in energy obviously work in conventionals so I'd imagine that that number is over 70 percent and they do represent the entire sort of you know the, the, the whole gamut of the, the that supply chain that the energy supply chain so they represent various sectors it's not just one or two sectors. But it's a good question because you know one of the, one of the things um, from the report says that the, the, there is confidence in the prospects of meeting targets designed to counter these risks. More than 60 percent expect the UAE to meet or exceed its 2030 emissions reduction goal, a cut of about 40 percent. Or similar proportion believe that the UAE will meet or exceed its 2050 energy diversification goal of 50 percent total energy from renewables and, and nuclear as well. So um, really a very positive outlook. I don't know, I mean, Nick, compared to the UK, what, w what would you say? Yeah, I, will the, uh, I would say the energy professionals in the UAE are a lot more optimistic than energy professionals in the UK. Um, and as an optimist myself, I think that's a real positive for the UAE, but uh, yeah. And maybe just a quick thing to add, I think the, um, the idea behind the survey was, was it for, for to be uh, sector agnostic. So we're focusing on the energy sector professionals, but we have respondents coming from oil and gas, renewables, uh, carbon capture and storage, et cetera. So we're really trying to get everyone on the table to have those discussions with us. Um, we can definitely you know, pull up some of the um, you know, backend um, demographic details, but I think we want it to have it as a sector agnostic tool so that we understand um, the overall idea behind um, some of the targets and commitments and some of the professionals' opinions as well. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there are two questions in one. Was the project, the survey, a consultant service or kind of partnership thing? And also, where are students involved, like intern and or whatever? I I, sorry, I didn't catch, didn't catch the second bit. The second one, or all of it? Say the whole thing again, please. Yeah, the question is, the project, the survey, was it a consultant service or it was done under other project or whatever? And secondly, where are students or interns involved for the case of capacity building, knowledge sharing kind of? There was no consultants. This was done by the Energy Institute. This was done by the research team at the Energy Institute. The Energy Institute has got a research team, and we, we work together also, myself, Abdul Latif Jada, from the Middle East, uh, to help them contextualize and check the questions and validate the survey. And uh, the respondents, I think that they were, so we have associate and student uh, members also of the Energy Institute. Maybe Shada can. 
Yeah, like I think the idea was that we were in engaging with, um, whether it's through the launch event or through um, sort of the wider um, Energy Institute's um, um, engagement, was to s share this out and get the results. But of course, in terms of the insights, etc., we have our student members as part of the Young Professionals Network who are uh, supporting with this, but also, um, you know, back uh, in the HQ looking at the insights and putting together um, this sort of a report. But just to not confuse this with the perhaps other publication uh, which uh, was done in partnership with KPMG but the barometer th results that we just walked through that that was not that was just my hat as a um, part of the Energy Institute yeah and, and just on the statistical review if I may there so we, we also work with Harriet Watt University um, so we have a number of PhD students who support us on this this product and I just wanted to add that on the barometer, they were also, we followed up with interviews with the respondents. So we, we got a, a, you know, um, we actually got a really good picture of why they responded the way they did. They expanded on, on the responses. So it was actually quite, uh, you know, they, they, it was quite a comprehensive um, job that we, we did. Uh, any other questions about the barometer or the statistical review? Actually, the question goes to positive use. So um, I'm really much, very much interested in this um, uh, positive view you, can, you got out of the research in terms that uh, EUA yeah, will reach 2030 and 2050 um, GSG goals. Uh, it's really interesting because we suffer with reaching goals and I'm not quite sure that neither of country will reach 2030 goals, uh, whatever they are, in U uh, not even in Europe, I, I hardly suspect. So uh, where that positivism comes from? Do, do, have you uh, managed to dig into the data further to see where that positivism comes from? We yesterday had one uh, really interesting Actually, day before yesterday, we had one really interesting conversation in terms how you will reach these goals. They are really ambitious. And yeah. we were answered, I believe in our people. So if that's the answer or there are some other answers. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very good question. And, and, and we didn't delve into that level of detail. So it's a gauge. Um, and I commented before that UK energy professionals were less optimistic. Now. That might be more realistic, I don't know. Um, the other thing we have launched today, um, so the statistical review provides all the data. Today, we've also launched a country tracker for the very first time. Um, this is a, a it's, it's the same data. Any, anybody could have taken the data, but we've, we've done some more analysis of the data that looks at some key attributes of the transition in terms of energy efficiency, in terms of the rate of decarbonization of the power system, and it actually ranks countries uh, along several of those parameters. Uh, that data has been published. You can look at it online. There's some very nice charts which kind of show where different countries are doing. And uh, you know, on some measures, the UAE is doing well. On other measures, less well, as is other, every other country. But, but maybe to kind of give a sense of how we get to the transition, I mean, Juliet has been working in the transition space for several years many years, and, and maybe ask her to share a few perspectives on, on how you see the transition yeah, playing th out. Thank, thanks, Nick. And um, uh, first of all, I'm very proud to be the president of the Energy Institute. I, joined, I, was, I was elected about nearly a year and a half ago. And I think the shift that the Institute itself has gone through over the last two years has been amazing. So first of all, we've taken on the statistical review, which is a huge piece of work for the organization. But it really allows an independent view of this data, which I think is fantastic. So that anybody can, any student all over the world can download the data from this and have a look and dig into it themselves. So first of all, just access to the information is completely changed. Um, 
And I think coming, coming to the key areas, I think the transition, if you want to move at pace, what do we need to be seeing? So the first thing is we need to be seeing innovative solutions. So we have some great solutions. We're surrounded by them here today. We've got some solar and wind come down in price significantly. But we also need to be delivering on carbon capture and storage. We need to be delivering on energy storage. We need to be delivering on integration into buildings. So there is a load of work that we still need to be doing. But the level of innovation that I'm seeing today, I, I started an energy company, a renewable energy company 25 years ago when it really, I, everybody thought it was a bit odd. Um, probably I still am a little odd from time to time, but um, the, the innovation side of it has completely transformed. So you, the companies here, the brains that are working on this. So that is one reason. Um, I think the second reason is we have the bankers here. Having finance and making sure that we're thinking about finance. Um, the third thing is, one of the things that developed countries can really do is think about their supply chains. So it's all very well looking at the countries that are producing a lot of the fossil fuels or producing the goods that we, we use, but it's actually us who use them in the end. So when, when we look at these different stakes, we actually need to be trying to think, what does our scope three really look like? And that is a completely different picture. And what we can do then is the financial instruments can start to put people on the spot to make sure their reporting is doing that. And it actually comes back to something really rather boring, is actually if our audit process, if our auditors and the financial reporting changed worldwide for international companies, that could transform the way and the pace we move. So I think we're beginning to unpick all the... Un so, so there are huge numbers of hidden blockers in this. Transmission networks are another one. But what I think we're beginning to see is a level of transparency we've never seen before. For me, one of the big areas in which what th this work is so important is that we will, if we, if we run hard enough at this, we will get a skills gap. And we need to be thinking about how we make sure we have the capacity worldwide to be training enough people to be delivering this energy transition. Um, I want to um, answer your question, maybe because, you know, from the Middle East perspective, huh? It's your, your question is, uh, talks about the challenge, this challenge that the whole world is facing. So I, I understand what you're saying. saying so why would uh, people over here, why would the perspective of the people, at least we surveyed and we questioned on this, why would they be so positive about actually not meet the UA meeting the targets, but actually reaching the targets before uh, they happen? Um, in other places in the world, as you know, there was a, uh, there was a lot of... Uh, uh, strong uh, position from people like leaders in Europe, for example, who, who said, you know, 20, 30, and 20. And, and now we see in the last uh, few years that, or last year or so, that they've, they've, they've kicked the, the can down the road, as they say, and said, oh, well, well actually not 20, 30, but 20, 35. Let's be a bit realistic. There's socioeconomic pressures, there's sociopolitical uh, uh, pressures, there's the Ukraine crisis, and, and so on and so forth, okay? But I, I'll tell you, because this is a complex question, uh, it has a complex answer, huh? so you bear with me. So there's, I think, five key reasons, right? Firstly, uh, nothing gets done without serious leadership, and I'm a serious commitment from leadership. Yeah, and I think that the UAE uh, has, uh, not because I'm saying this because I'm a national, I'm, I think we have in this country 206 nationalities who live here. You talk to many of the nationalities who live here, they feel that they are part of the UAE. And we, as nationals, love to have them to be part of the UAE with us because they make the UAE with us. Our leadership brings everyone together, but our leadership doesn't say things and not do them. Honestly speaking, they do things, they say things and then they do and they follow through. And, and I think that that's very, very important. So that gives people a positive outlook. The other thing is that we have the resources. Alhamdulillah, you know, God has been uh, very, uh, very uh, uh, good with us in this part of the world. We have a lot of resources. We have, obviously, a lot of conventional uh, resources. But we are not just relying on these resources. We have proven reserves, I think. I don't know what it is, but it's more than 200 years of oil, you know, if we continue at present production. Um, so, but, but, but the leadership has not said, okay, well, because they understand that this is not sustainable. Um, they will continue uh, to engage in conventionals because that is what the world needs, but in that transition. But they are committed, and we are sitting here in, in Mazdar, which is a, 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 you know, an example of the commitment of the UAE 
towards renewables. And they're not building projects only here in the UAE. They are funding many, many projects all over the world, you know, and working in collaboration with others. Also, we have very, very, I think, pragmatic and forward-thinking policies. We don't have a lot of bureaucracy. When we want to get things done, the leadership says, listen, let's get it done. People sit down. Sometimes I would say, uh, if any criticism of the UAE, that we move too fast sometimes and not always plan things. And they say, oh, well, they don't. But actually, I think we've learned a lot. And I think now the UAE plans and does. But it doesn't procrastinate. We do not procrastinate in this country. And this is also because uh, our leadership are not procrastinators. You know, um, We have a young population. You know, the UAE population, just the UAE population, is uh, between the age of 20 and 40, we have 50% of the population of the UAE, of the UAE nationals. The UAE nationals below the age of 40, 85%. This is completely the opposite of places like Europe. So we have a lot of people very positive about the future, and why not? I mean, you just have to walk around the UAE to be positive about the future, right? And then finally, we, we don't work alone. The UAE has been for many, many years, many, many years, since the days of Sheikh Rashid, may he rest in peace, uh, Sheikh uh, Zayed, may he rest in peace, always reached out to the rest of the world in collaboration, trying to learn from them. In saying all of this, this is all positive. I tell you, there are challenges. Challenges include financing and green financing and understanding green financing and, and you know, um, the, uh, the, what is the right cost of capital. We are still, the banks are still working this out because a lot of people don't understand many things about, uh, you know, um, about renewables and about, you know, the energy transition, what they should be funding. And they, they don't understand how long it takes. So, you know, funding oil and gas projects, for example, we have precedent on this. We know oh, seven years, 10 years, payback, whatever. Here, we don't know. We don't know also how long these assets are gonna last, how much the maintenance cost is gonna be, how the efficiency is changing. Solar efficiency, for example, in the last 20 years has improved, I don't know, four or five fold, you know. So, you know, and the materials and all that. Skills, we have a big problem. We don't have all the skills that we need. Uh, and if you look in the next five years, are we gonna have enough skilled people to, to basically help this uh, move forward. Um, we have also internal competition for resources, so we have to balance between the conventionals and the non-conventionals. We have uh, also the issue of energy security, so whilst we can go and do this and do that, we also, as a, as a relatively small nation, the GCC, this region has to also be concerned about uh, energy security, and finally, I don't think so far we are developing enough technology through our you know, collaborations with academia and research institutes enough. But we can see this in the Diwa, uh, you know, for example, Hamad al-Rashid Solar Park, uh, Mazdar is doing a lot of research around this. So we see now that, but that capacity takes time to build. You can't make a scientist overnight. It takes years and years. So, uh, inshallah, I, I, I'm very, very, I am personally also a positive like a lot of the people who, but, but I'm sorry I went on, but you know, a complex answer requires and uh, you know, we have to give you a complex uh, a answer to your answers. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Wada. And I think one of the other, um, in also answer to your question, the fact that the UAE does have the most diversified energy uh, mix of all the GCC countries, and there is no, none of the delays in permitting, for example, you know, got miles of desert. So it's not that difficult to set up a, a solar park, which, and we have some of the biggest. The percentages might be small, but in terms of what is being done, there's quite a lot. And of course, nuclear is already here. I don't think you're, today, you would be thinking about building a nuclear power plant, whereas here you've got the fourth unit coming up, and that's going to provide 25% of, um, of the country's primary energy demand. So. You know, there are, yes, challenges, but at the same time, there are also advantages to being in a country where you have a sort of strong leadership, top-down, and, and also, I think, targets that are achievable because we're seeing them. I mean, you're going to see a lot more solar power coming online. Abu Dhabi, in fact, Abu Dhabi is going to overtake Dubai uh, by the end of this year. So, you know, you're seeing it happen. You've got new projects coming on all the time. Hydrogen economy is, um, is being developed. So I don't think it's unreasonable to think that, but you know, targets are targets. Um, anybody else have any questions or 
comments about the barometer, the work? Yes, please, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for this very insightful discussion. And we can see uh, oil prices are fluctuating, which is like, you know, impacting energy prices as well. So after completing the energy transition exercise, do we expect more stabilized energy prices? Yeah, so, yeah, stabilization of the energy prices after the completion of the energy transition. Do we expect this to happen and, you know, get more stabilized energy prices? I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy to answer that. So, so I think what, what you have is a process where you're going from one system to a new system. So when you get to the new system, actually you should have much more stable prices because essentially the, the only thing you're having to mitigate is less, you, you, you understand production. Production is not, so production, um, energy prices are affected by two things in the, in the transition world. One will be the amount of sun and two will be the amount of wind, which will be a statistical forward fu future position, which most of the time you'll take a, a forward insurance hedge out, something along those lines. You'll then have to manage demand, but if, you actually, if we actually design a system that's not a centralized system, but a decentralized system, then demand will also respond to this energy market, and you'll get a smoothing effect to the prices. So, so I mean, it's a view, but my personal view is you'll see a stabilization of prices in that world. However, what you will see in this transition where we are contracting, so I'll give the UK market as an example. So we contract for power, for renewable power in the UK through a government mechanism that incentivizes gigawatt hours. Now that's gigawatt hours at any time of day. But actually, there are certain times of day we want more gigawatt hours than other times. So we need to be much more intelligent about the way that we start contracting through this energy transition to ensure against what we will see is a destabilization of prices. Um, and we also need to be thinking about what, what other mechanisms can we include. So energy trading is a mechanism for helping stabilize that price. But it doesn't really exist yet in these markets because they're, they're too regulated and they have too much intervention by government in those particular marketplaces. So either you need governments just to stabilize it, or you need them to get out of the way and let the market stabilize it. But when you've got a hybrid of the two, that's when you get a real problem with the pricing. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have anything to add to questions, comments? If we don't have any more, yes, sorry. What's the story with, um, about you getting the statistical review from BP? Like, why, why did they drop it? Did you ask for it? It's quite a big deal that you've managed to get that, isn't it? It's a great question. Um, look, I, I can't speak for BP. Um, I did used to work at BP, which may have helped with the, the relationship. But, I, you know, B, BP is going through a, a transition of its own. And the team who produ used to produce the statistical review, who, who have been incredibly supportive, um, they have two flag. They had two flagships products. One of them was the statistical review. The other is the BP's energy outlook. And I, I think there was a sense of focus and using that team's capacity to support BP's uh, understanding of the transition. So um, when I discussed it with Spencer Dale, the chief economist, and um, you know he talked about what, how would the world react if we stopped producing the statistical review. I said, well, pretty poorly. Many, many, many people rely on the data in this product, not just the energy industry, but the finance industry, the insurance industry, uh, journalists, many others. And so I, uh, <laughs> I took the opportunity to offer that the Energy Institute might become the new home. And unfortunately, we were able to convince them that we would be a safe pair of hands working with our, our partners, KPMG and Carney. So uh, very delighted to have taken it on. And, and I think the exciting thing is, I think BP had credibility but BP only had credibility because it had been doing it for 71 years. As a, as a trusted, neutral, professional body, I hope we can maintain that trust in the product. Um, but we can also do new things. I think the, the country tracker that we've launched today might not have otherwise happened um, were it not in our hands. So we're, we're really looking forward to evolving the product and doing much more with it in the, in the coming months and years. 
And, and, and Nick, if I could add to that, I think the thing about the Energy Institute, the Energy Institute plays a role in the middle of, as an independent. So one of the other pieces of work that we do is, is we have this, uh, the Science and Technology Committee, which basically has done a lot of work on health and safety standards across the industry. So we, we can bring the industry together on non-commercial issues to make sure that it does uh, that it that it that looks after the energy professionals who work within it. Um, and for me, the statistical review is an ex ex a perfect example of where we can play an independent role, bringing data to the industry, so that the energy professionals can use that to do their jobs better. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody have final words that they would like to say before we, uh, well, we still have time, so any additional comments that you would like to make, expand on? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think um, I, just, to, just to carry on from there, I think, I think we're at a really exciting point in the transition where we have become to uncover a lot of the, the, concern, the, the issues that block us from moving to transition. We have, um, so I, I think the first COP I ever went to was COP9, where industry was in a small room, probably not much bigger than this. Um, and uh, uh, although there has been some criticism of the number of um, companies and industries here, I actually think it's a hugely positive point. Because industry are the people who are going to have to get down and put their hard hats on and deliver this. They're going to be the people on the ground making sure that the future transition is more than just words. It's actually actions and delivery. Um, and I think making sure that we look after those people is absolutely key. So, so the work that we do at the Energy Institute, providing training, we have a new program, the executive program, uh, that we are launching, making sure that we've got high-level leadership, because it's going to take leadership throughout all the organizations in the energy sector to really deliver on the energy transition. We then need to make sure that we have diverse leadership. So obviously, um, I'm very keen on seeing more women in this sector. First of all, it's more fun. Uh, for me personally, but, uh, um, but, but also we need that diversity of voice in there. We need to be seeing risks in different ways. We need to take a different angle and everything. So I think there's a launch tomorrow at the UK Pavilion on Powerful Women Report. I think Nick will be there at 8.30. Well done, Nick. Uh, early start tomorrow, but 8.30 in the UK <laughs> Pavilion in the Blue Zone. Um, and then I think making sure that we, we're thinking through um, how this transition is going to affect the whole industry in terms of its standards. What, what are going to be the rather dull things that actually people don't think about? We make some nice headline statements like we're going to triple renewable instrumentation. Brilliant. But what's that going to take in terms of the number of grid networks that are going to be needed on the ground? The amount of engineering capability that we're going to need to train in the next 10 years? And the amount of innovation that we're going to have to see, whether that's in semiconductors, in transformers, Every single part of this industry is going to have to up its game. And making sure that we are all here to do that, I think is incredibly important. And I hope that the Energy Institute can play its role, because that's why I joined as president. So, yes. Thank you, Thank you very much. I think we have a question from one of our own. <laughs> uh, thank you, Kate. Um, a question to the panelists, but probably uh, Nick and uh, Julia more and then Dr. Waddah. We keep hearing many people saying switch off the oil refineries and let's go clean only. How can you respond to this uh, call or to this uh, say? Well look, um, we clearly cannot turn off, we, we, could, we could turn off the oil refineries and the world would stop within about 24 hours, we know that. Um, and so we have got to be deeply pragmatic that the world will continue to use oil and gas, hopefully not coal, and I think that one of the outcomes we really need to get from this COP is a very, very clear pathway of coal stopping. I have to say, when I saw that Japan is gonna stop coal by 2050, I was pretty shocked at the time frame they're talking about. Um, but equally, you know, as we're realistic, what does worry me is the, the rhetoric that the world continues to need fossil fuel, therefore we must continue to do it. And, and to me, this is not licensed to carry on business as usual. Business as usual is not going to get us to where we need to. 
We are seeing the impacts of climate change, as Shahada said, here in the UAE, we're seeing them in the UK, we're seeing them all over Europe, we're seeing them particularly in the most vulnerable developing nations of the world, where there are countries like the Maldives which are going to be underwater. The Maldives will not exist as a physical country at some point, likely in this century. So I think we've got to make some really important uh, choices around how we decarbonize quickly. There's been some really important announcements already at this COP. Um, methane, methane isn't a sexy subject. People tend not to get excited about methane. It doesn't, you can't see it, uh, you can't smell it. Um, but actually tackling methane emissions, fugitive me methane emissions from all sources, but particularly the energy system, is the biggest single thing we can do this decade. So I was delighted to see some of the announcements that came out earlier this week about tackling methane right here, right now. Um, on the one hand, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't use that as an excuse to say, well, oil and gas can carry on business as usual forever. But on the other hand, if we don't tackle the low-hanging fruit, forget, forget sustainable aviation fuel, hydrogen, all those great things. If we cannot tackle things like methane, then we're, we're, you know, we're not on the pitch. So we have got to get after that fugitive uh, methane, reducing flaring, et cetera. I don't know if others want to make any final comments on that topic. I, mean, I, I, think, I think the key thing you have to look at is balance sheets. So I think you really have to think forward is that when we are letting new licenses for oil and gas, classic case in the UK at the moment, is that how long will those licenses actually be valid for? Because at some point, you, you can't expect to take on a new license and then go back to the government and said, well, I can't use my license because there's too much renewables on the system. That is the risk you have to take now. And I think this is, this is, this is really what the crux is. It's just because it's on your balance sheet doesn't mean you get the right to it. And I think that's the way we need to be thinking forwards. There will be absolutely oil and gas in this transition and it needs to be there, but it doesn't, we don't need it all. So that is the challenge, is who's oil and gas is they're going to be on the table, and whose balance sheets will be the ones of the future? No, I, I don't think I can add anything to that. I, I, I wanted, before we close today, just to take maybe a few minutes to talk about the um, very, very exciting um, energy leadership program that, uh, that it's been constructed. This is this has taken uh, a few uh, bit of time, let's say, in the making. But I, I just want to highlight that, uh, you know, the program has not been, it's not a cut and paste or a, we picked this up and made an executive program just based on other programs. We uh, constructed this program to meet the requirements not only of where we think the leaders uh, need to be at today, but the leaders that need to be in the next five years. And as we know, and as we're talking, it's very, very difficult to make commitments and a lot of leaders who are making commitments in the next five, ten years, you know, sometimes, you know, you could, you could be quite skeptical and say, well, they know they're not going to be around for the next five, ten years, so it's okay to put some targets. But what I think the Energy Institute wants to do is actually prepare and make sure that we are future ready and we have the right leadership uh, in the next five, ten years to actually move this forward. So the program that has been constructed by the Energy Institute, it's a, it's a very, very unique program and one which we have done... Um, in collaboration with uh, the Halt, uh, the Halt Ashridge Business School, which is one of the um, one of the top business schools in the world, so um, it's it, it combines executive education, but at the same time with an in-depth understanding of the kind of leadership that is required for leaders coming in the in the future, which means that they must understand energy, must understand the energy transition, must understand the challenges of change management must understand what kind of leadership styles are required for the future and leadership thinking and, you know, situational leadership, sense-making, all these kind of issues. And, and the, the faculty um, that we've engaged with, um, the course directors that we've put on this program are really, really people with, with an immense amount of experience of working with leaders, working with board directors. Um, so a lot of thought has gone into this. And when we initially constructed the program, it looks quite different to what it is today. And the reason for that is because we have taken this program through several consultation um, cycles. Um, so it is really, we believe, very much tailor-made. And I don't think for the region, I'm very, very confident, for the region, 
um, this will be the best executive, uh, um, executive program for energy executives uh, moving forward. Of course, proof is in the pudding, and inshallah, we hope that we're going to be having the first cohort, I think, sometime in end of, end of March or a early April. Um, but we're hoping to have about at least three, four cohorts a year. The Energy Institute also has aspirations to take this then to other places in the world, uh, to Africa, to the Far East, to Malaysia, um, and, um, and other places, obviously, in the, in the GCC. But I'm very, very proud to say that we'll be launching the first program here in the UAE, uh, which I think is the right place for this program to be launched, inshallah, in April. And maybe, Nick, you want to add a few things on the program? You happy with that? Okay. Yeah, I think, I mean, just on that note, because I think uh, what Dr. Wadah mentioned, it's about not just preparing and uh, supporting the leaders of today, uh, but also the leaders of tomorrow. Um, and I think that pretty much is aligned with some of the uh, work that we're trying to do when it comes to the engagement um, across the Young Professionals Network. Um, and I've also recently taken on um, another kind of internal role with looking at um, building a Leaders 2015 network within my own firm as well. Um, and, and some of the engagement that we're seeing is that a lot of young professionals, even outside um, you know, the energy sector, outside sustainability, outside um, some of the you know, key themes that we're discussing today, they're also very much interested to support this energy transition. They're also very much interested to see how they can work towards you know, building a better world and um, how they, um, how can they have um, a la long-lasting positive impact in terms of the way that they're working? And I think, um, you know, that kind of uh, comes across when it comes to the opt optimistic viewpoint, but also um, the fact that they want to be a bit more engaged. And I think uh, platforms like the Energy Institute and also within their own uh, work, within their own uh, jobs, those are really the, the type of um, opportunities that young professionals are very keen to engage in. Um, and also, I think trainings and capacity building, really upskilling um, on those uh, low carbon and green skills are vital to support young professionals in this transition as well, um, whether it's through these leadership programs or, or others, because I think those are targeted for a bit more of a senior audience, but we also have other um, uh, programs that can support really when it comes to understanding fundamentals of energy management and other topics as well. Um, so yeah, I think that's just um, the note for me, and, and hopefully you, you all get to learn a bit more about uh, some of the results within um, the full uh, reports that you can also access. Thank you very much. I think that concludes our session. Um, it used to be said that the, um, the lowest cost oil barrel would be the one that would meet demand in the future, but I think it's the lowest carbon barrel, uh, the advantage barrel, and this is where it's at in, in this part of the world. Um, thank you again to the panelists. Thank you to Mustar for hosting us. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you all here, and uh, thank you very much for your questions and your comments. Thank you.